O Holy Spirit, show us that for Joshua, God's help in winning the battle against Jericho was not the end of his amazing life under God. Amen. Well, good day. It is good to have you back as we look at Joshua's heart for God in the what now moments. And we will begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, I am curious, how many of you know the epilogue to Joshua's story? It's all good if you don't know, as it is rarely discussed. Most people don't know the answer. Have you ever thought about what happened after Joshua and the Israelites had seen God's incredible power in action, bringing down the walls of Jericho before their very eyes, helping them to quickly defeat Jericho. I wondered whether Joshua sat down and thought, what now? What is going to happen now? Naturally, he would have known that there were many more battles ahead of him and the Israelites. After all, taking out just one city, it doesn't conquer a whole country. But after Jericho, did he think that from now on there would be no need for God to perform any more miraculous works to help them conquer a whole country? The army was really buzzing and on a high after witnessing God stop the flooded Jordan and now collapse Jericho's walls. There is no problem for now everyone for miles around knows just how powerful their God truly is and they will be running for the hills before they even get close to fighting them. What do you think if you were Joshua? Would you be expecting more miracles from God to help them conquer the land? Well, from the narrative, it does appear that Joshua didn't expect he would be needing God's help. We see him sticking to the true and tried formula that both he and Moses had previously used by sending spies to check out the next place to be conquered, Ai. And when the spies return, they reported how, hey, the town has only got a few people in it, so we only need to uh, send two or three thousand men. It appears they don't need God's help. And so being all cocky and full of themselves after the Battle of Jericho, they went off with 3,000 men who were soundly beaten by the men of Ai. And 36 of them were killed. Okay, how would you be feeling now if you were Joshua and the army. We all thought that they would be deflated, insecure, ashamed, with their confidence totally shredded. And the Bible describes it as how the hearts of the people melted and became like water. From the way the Bible describes Joshua's physical response, it was probable that Joshua was thinking along the lines of what now? What's going on here? How did it all go so wrong? For we read that Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. And all the elders of Israel joined him and they sprinkled dust on their heads. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems a really weird thing to do. Like, why would Joshua and the elders want to tear their clothes? After all, they didn't have a major store to pop into to buy new clothes. Their clothes were handmade. 
and then to spend the rest of the day with their faces on the ground, in the dust, before the ark, sprinkling dust or ashes on their heads, just over losing a battle? And as always, when things in the Bible don't make sense, the best thing to do is go and look for other times the Bible mentions tearing clothes and chucking ashes or dust on oneself to get some context as to why Joshua and the elders resorted to this extreme measure. The reason for looking for both dust and ashes is that the Hebrew word covers dust, ashes, powder, mortar, rubbish, among other similar words. In Joshua's case, it would be dust from the ground or ashes from their fire pits that they would have used. Now, I realize this is going to probably be a pretty mean question, but do you know the first time the Bible mentions someone tearing their clothes? Well, for those who don't know, and I didn't, the first time we hear about someone practicing Kriya, which is the Hebrew word for tearing one's clothing, is in Genesis and the story of Joseph. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph wasn't there, he tore his clothes. He went to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there, where can I turn now? For Reuben, tearing his clothes was an outward expression showing his dismay at not knowing what am I to do now to fix this mess? And then after Joseph's brothers return home with their solution to fix the mess they had got themselves into by giving their father Jacob Joseph's torn and bloodied robe. Their solution works for Jacob assumes Joseph is dead, tears his clothes and puts on sackcloth. And the next time someone tears their clothes is Joshua. But then even as you continue reading throughout the Bible, you find many people who copy Reuben and Jacob by tearing their clothes as a strikingly powerful outward expression showing their intense anguish and sorrow or regret over a calamity or death or as a sign of repentance for their sin. The other fascinating detail about Kiara is that it is still carried out today by modern Israelites at funerals. And from this we learn that it is the clothing on or near the heart that is torn. And by revealing the heart, this symbolizes the extreme emotions felt in the heart at this time. And the only time prior to Jacob that we hear of ashes in any other sense beyond what's left of wood when it's burnt completely is when Abraham says to the angel of the Lord, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. From Abraham's disclaimer, we can see that dust and ashes were used as a metaphor about his lack of worthiness to boldly come and speak to God. And while the book of Job is placed later in the Bible, it is believed to be written around the same time as Abraham and Jacob. We read that after Job is afflicted with his painful sores all over his whole body, he scraped himself with a piece of broken pottery and sat among the ashes. There should be no problem seeing that this was Job's way of expressing his grief and anguish over all the terrible things that had happened to him. And whether from Job's time putting ashes over your head and had developed into a more appropriate way to express your emotional turmoil than sitting in ashes, or whether Joshua and the leaders started a new trend because they had no houses with fireplaces 
to sit in. But one thing is for sure. Joshua and the leaders' external display of putting ashes or dust on their heads was showing to all and sundry their inner grief as they lay before the ark of the Lord. What we need to understand here is how the Israelites considered standing before the ark, or on, in this case, flat on the ground, as like being in the very presence of God himself. They are not trying to hide their pain and deep anguish from God. Oh no, no, no. It is like Joshua and the leaders were in such anguish and turmoil over being defeated by the small, tiny, pathetic army from Ai that they have gone all out, spending the rest of the day uncomfortable with their faces in the dirt before the Ark of the Lord, letting God know and see their grief. In a sense, they are figuratively speaking getting right up in God's face, putting it all out there, letting God see just how upset and mortified they are at this turn of events. But then Joshua does something really amazing. After all, by now, most people would have been having a pity me party, worrying about how their reputation is going to be damaged beyond repair. This should have been so easy. A walk in the park, really. And here they are defeated. They would be like Reuben going, what now? How am I going to get myself out of this mess? What am I going to do and still look good? But Joshua, seriously, who is this guy? Didn't even come close to thinking along those lines. Instead, he says, Okay, Sovereign Lord, just why did you bring these people across the Jordan only to have the Amorites destroy us? Why hadn't we been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan? Oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been defeated by the enemy? Everyone will hear about this and will come to wipe us out. What then will you do for your own great name. Okay, something else for you to think about in Joshua's cry to God. What do you discover about Joshua's character and his heart attitude towards God? In this cry to God, we get a glimpse into Joshua's heart and attitude, which has been hidden from us previously in the narrative. And now we are shown how Joshua had some serious doubts about whether perhaps they had got it wrong, thinking they had heard God say they were to cross the Jordan. Had God really wanted them to cross the Jordan? Had he got it wrong about God wanting them to conquer Canaan? Perhaps they should have been happy with the land they had fought for and won on the other side of the Jordan? Hmm. Had he decided that it would be good for the Israelites to cross the Jordan and have more land and decided to use God as the excuse to get what he thought would be good for Israel. And of course that would make him look good too. But it was his final statement that showed the true state of Joshua's heart. Fair dinkum, this is truly incredible. Joshua's anguish and grief didn't come from a heart that was worrying about what people thought about him as a leader. He didn't care that his leadership skills were now going to be questioned and he would probably be given the boot. Nope. What Joshua was incredibly worried about was that God's great name would be mocked and people would be considering God as a has-been who was so weak and pathetic he couldn't look after his own people. And here 
we see a guy who was truly doing what he was created for, to image God, to treasure God in his heart as being more important than himself. And what do you reckon about God's response to Joshua's distress at the Israelites' situation? Well, there is one thing for sure with God's response. He isn't into the politically correct, softly, softly approach. There is no, oh Joshua, there, there, it's all okay. You have done your best. That's all we can ask of you. Well, far from it. As we see with God saying, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have stolen, lied, taken some of the devoted things and put them with their own possessions. That is why they cannot defeat their enemies. They are now liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. God goes on to tell Joshua that have the people consecrate themselves ready for tomorrow when I, the Lord, will reveal who had violated God's commands and brought disgrace to Israel. Now, we need to digress for a moment to discuss how Joshua had told the army for a second time, just after the shofar had blown for the seventh time, and right before the army marched up over the rubble of the wall into Jericho. Joshua had reminded the whole army how the Lord had commanded that they are to keep away from silver and gold, bronze and iron, for they are devoted to the Lord. Otherwise, you will not only bring about your own destruction, you will also make the whole camp of Israel liable for destruction and bring trouble on it. So there was no chance that the soldier had forgotten God's command. So when he had deliberately disobeyed God, he was also well aware of the consequences for his disobedience. Have you ever thought about how the guilty person felt as he consecrated himself to meet God? Did he sleep much that night? Or did he spend the night trying to weigh up the odds against being found out? Then the next day, as Joshua started drawing the lots, as the first lot chose the tribe, his. Then the families were chosen, his families. And as the lot started for each individual person, the odds were getting lower. Was he starting to sweat and regret his rash decision to choose what would be good for him and steal those items? Then God's choice through the lot fell to Achan as being the soldier who had sinned against the Lord. And again, we see Joshua immediately directing all the glory and praise to God as he tells Achan to give glory to the Lord, give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan confessed. And here we see the fairness of Joshua in that he didn't just accept the confession, he had it checked out before he formally declared Achan guilty. Punishment was swiftly executed against Achan and his whole family along with the stuff he had stolen and also all his livestock. To us modern people, this seems a very extreme and unnecessarily harsh punishment, particularly where the animals are concerned, as really they wouldn't know anything. There is no way they could be accessories after the fact. 
but the idea behind the punishment is that no one but no one is going to benefit financially from his crime even if he's killed which we often see is the way thieves think they sort of go along the lines of it doesn't matter if I get caught and spend time in jail as the loot is hidden and my family well they will be provided for Achan's punishment was so severe because his sin of deliberately disobeying God by stealing stuff that was to be given to God had set a really bad precedent for the Israelites. It would create copycat sins of people disobeying God and stealing what belonged to God. This needed to be stopped in its tracks right here and now. People needed to be aware that disrespecting God by disobeying his commands carried serious consequences. For if they did copy his disobedience, then God's chosen people would not be imaging his glory to the other nations. Instead, they would quickly become like the Canaanites, whose sins, as God had told Abraham, were the reason he had decided to give their land to the Israelites. And the other thing we need to be aware of is that it was only 38 years earlier that God had made it perfectly clear in his new laws that the head of the household was to be responsible for and will also be held responsible for his household's well-being and standing before their God. And as such, because Achan was the head of his household, and by association it could be assumed Achan's family had some knowledge and were aiding and abetting him in the crime. Therefore, they are an accomplice after the fact. And so this meant the whole household, whether they were or not, would be considered guilty of disobeying God along with Achan. And we need to hang on to that idea, how God considered the head of the house as being that person responsible for everyone within their households and their relationship with God. As this is relevant to help us understand an important, very important declaration Joshua makes towards the end of his life. Which unfortunately, once again, we don't have time to look at and give it proper explanations right now. And so we will finish. Amen.